My name is Jess Winch. I'm the news editor. And it is my very great pleasure to be joined here by Michelle Hussein, who does not need a huge introduction. But just to recap, she has been a broadcaster and journalist at the BBC for, I think, over 20 years. Mm -hmm presents the Today programme on BBC Radio 4. She presents the news on BBC One. She has reported a number of critically acclaimed documentaries. She recently took a frontline role in the UK election coverage, managing the leaders' debates, refereeing the leaders' debates, perhaps. And among all of that, she managed to find the time to write this brilliant family memoir, Broken Threads, My Family, from Empire to Independence. Michelle, welcome to Tortoise. Thank, Thank you, you so much, here. Jess. Thank you, Tortoise. Thanks everyone for coming along and those joining online as well. Yes. Now, for those who haven't been to a Tortoise thinking before, the rule is very simple, which is that we would really love for you to get involved during the hour. Please don't wait for the end of the 60 minutes or so that we have to put up your hand and ask a question. If you have a thought, if you have a contribution, please just wave at me and I will make sure that a mic gets brought to you. And for everybody watching online, welcome. Please put any thoughts or comments or questions in the online chat. And my colleague, George, who is watching it all, will, she will take charge of waving madly at me and then she will bring you in as well. So thank you very much and let's get started. So Michelle, this, um, this beautiful book on the cover, Broken Threads, feels like something that you have been thinking about for a very long time. It's the tale of your four grandparents and their experience of empire and partition as the new state of Pakistan came into being in 1947. Can you tell us a little bit about the impetus that actually made you sit down to start writing it? I think three years ago, you said downstairs? Yes, I feel as if this has been in the back of my mind, but very, very much in the really back of my mind all my life, really. Two of the two of the four people who are my central characters, my my four grandparents. Two of them were a part of my adult life: my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandfather. And there were times, I mean, I guess maybe I was a journalist in the making for all of that time. That I did ask them questions about their lives before Pakistan, how they grew up, and and so it was always always there. But I never thought of it as a book. And then about. About three years ago, I started to think, well, maybe I will write something personal. And uh, and initially, I thought, I'll write the story of my two grandmothers and women's lives in South Asia in the 20th century and how my two grandmothers, one studied to be a nurse, one studied to be a doctor, and how I realized that their opportunities were completely different to those of my great-grandmothers, their, their mothers. And so I thought this immense shift was happening at the beginning of the 20th century in women's lives in South Asia, as it was uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And and I'll tell the story of social mobility and social transformation and greater equality for women. And, and as I started off on that project, I realized that, uh, that the best documentation I had about the experiences of my grandmothers really were, as is often the case with, with women, um, were through the eyes of their husbands because they had left an unpublished memoir in the case of my father's father, Mumtaz, and um, a series of published books and other writings in the series of my other grandfather. So I thought, oh God, well, I, I don't really want to see these women through the eyes of their husbands. I, I, I need other material and I can rely on memory. But as I started developing what I thought was the story of these two women, I realized that actually the story I wanted to tell was was of a generation. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about my grandparents' generation in South Asia, I realized that these were four people who were born in the first part of the 20th century who absolutely thought that the British Empire into which they were born would last forever. There was no sign in that period before the First World War and after the First World War when they were born that the British were going anywhere. And therefore, they made professional choices accordingly. They were um, learning in English. This was, this was very much the way that they saw their futures. And then straight after the Second World War, in which both my grandparents served, uh, both my grandfathers served, Life completely changed in these extraordinarily tumultuous two years between 1945 and 1947. And all four of them, two couples, ended up in Pakistan. Only three of my um, 
only one of my four grandparents was actually born in the territory that became Pakistan. So all the rest either left family behind in India or moved with their entire family um, from India to, to Pakistan. So their lives were really changed forever in 1947 in a way that I don't think they realized at the time. I think when they made that big journey, I think that they probably thought, they certainly thought they'd be able to go back and forth. But they even, I think, possibly thought that maybe India and Pakistan would be part of a federation. Initially at independence, they were both these countries were dominions of the British Empire. So they didn't, you know, their decision that summer changed the lives of their children and, and indeed affected the lives of a subsequent generation of which I'm a part, their grandchildren. But I don't think they, they realized what a huge step they were, they were taking at that, at that moment in time. So that was the story essentially I started to tell. And I, and I felt that this was an accessible way into a very complex period of history, which is not very well known in Britain. And even in India and Pakistan is full of agendas, you know, nationalist agendas and the way people want to tell these, um, the stories of the, uh, the, the founding fathers and the birth of these nations. So I wanted to take as dispassionate a look as possible, at least in terms of the history, while trying to see that period through the eyes of, of four people who were very dear to me. And how much had they told you growing up? There's a lovely section right at the beginning of the book where you describe your grandmother's house that really seems to have been the anchor for yeah, you growing my up. My mother's family's house, yes, because... That was in Pakistan. You yes. talk about going and all having a siesta until the tea trolley <laughs> wheels were heard at four yes. and how she left I jasmine think... flowers out at night and the yes. smell... I think because I was an expat child, my although I was born here, my father moved from the NHS. He'd qualified as a doctor in Pakistan, come here as a young doctor, and then we moved to the Middle East. So I was part of a you know itinerant expatriate family living in the Middle East, and so, and at that point, my father's parents were, were also kind of itinerant because they were working for the United Nations and and also living in the Middle East but my mother's family were very very much rooted in the north of Pakistan and theirs was the only house I knew which never changed from one year to the next and when you're an expat child as I was that's quite important because it was like the one the one place you'd come back to and the routine is always the same and you knew exactly what Mm. how the day would pan out, meals were at certain times. All of that, I think, was a real point of stability in my life and continued to be so after I came to England and went to boarding school. You know, it was still the only real point of stability in my life. So, yes, yeah, so my grandmother, Tyra, certainly talked to me a lot about her life before independence. And I knew that she and my grandfather, Shahid, had witnessed some quite extraordinary um, events up close because they were part of an inner circle in Delhi. Uh, my grandfather Shahid was working for Field Marshal Auchinleck, who was the second most important man in British India. In British India, the most important person is the Viceroy, which was Lord Mountbatten by the time of independence. And the second most important man in British India, always a man, of course, um, was the commander in chief of the Indian army, which actually meant all the Indian armed forces. And that at the time of independence was Claude Auchinleck and my grandfather was working directly for him. So I knew that they'd had this incredible vantage point. And then my father's parents, and right here in the audience, one of my father's siblings who's visiting from Pakistan is right here with me. So I'm talking Welcome. about his, his parents here. <laughs> Please do interrupt if you <laughs> yes, exactly. if, I, if, I get any, if I get anything wrong. But my uncle Ijaz has actually been so important to the writing of this book. And while you're in the acknowledgements, I haven't had a chance to say this to you in person in this kind of setting. But if he hadn't saved my grandfather's unpublished memoir from his computer when he died and sent it to all the family and said, I think you should all have a copy of this, I would never have been able to write this book or this book would not be the book that it is because he saved the material which I looked at 10 years later, maybe more than 10 years later. So you've been incredibly important to all of this. But again, my that of those grandparents, Shai, um, Muntaz, my father's father also lived into my adult life. And I also did have a chance to talk to him. And 
you know, he painted this extraordinary picture of the social fabric of his family and the difficulties that he and my grandmother Mary had because theirs was a cross-religious marriage, a Muslim married to a Christian. Um, their common language was English because they came from two completely different parts of South Asia. Their family certainly couldn't communicate with each other in their native languages. Um, and, you know, so they crossed religious, ethnic, cultural lines. And so that was, again, the story that became part of it. So I guess part of it is big history, if you like, and, and other parts of it is the lives of people who are just trying to do ordinary things, like think about how they're going to earn a living and how they're going to educate their children and how they're going to, you know, survive. That, was, that seemed struck me as one of the problems or issues, I suppose, that Mary and Mumtaz faced when they got married, not just that they were crossing the religious divide, but also that his parents in particular didn't seem happy with the idea because they wanted him to marry someone else. And yes. her family were very worried about how they were going to make yes. a living. In fact, I think um, we've got a, we've got some pictures of them, which maybe we can yeah. show. So Mary and Mumtaz, that's uh, Mary and Mumtaz in that um, picture there. They, they met in Lahore in 1940. She had come all the way from the other side of India, from the area sort of between Madras and Calcutta on the eastern seaboard, and come to train as a nurse in Lahore. And he had come from his um, sit home city in the south of Punjab to train as a doctor. Uh, and that was how they met. And, and yes, initially they kept their their marriage secret from both sets of their of their of their families. Um, and had a very difficult time getting married because they wanted to get married in both a mosque and a church. And they had great difficulty finding either an imam or a priest, a Catholic priest willing to marry them. But they did in the end marry in the eyes of both of their faiths. And Mumtaz's parents took a, took much longer to come around to the idea because they had planned for him to marry his cousin. And what he did was a tremendous upset. So it was not easy to, and, 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 you know, my grandmother Mary died when I was very young, but mm. because her sister, my great aunt Anne, is still alive, aged 100 she a just few celebrated days ago. Yeah, she yes. just celebrated her 100th birthday. And I was able to sit with her and she was able to, you know, tell me about, um, about my grandmother's life through, through her eyes. Mm. And that was an incredible resource, you know, to still have one of that generation alive is just wonderful. But there is a, a difference sometimes between what the family, what the family stories say, and then what, as, as a mm. researcher, as a journalist, you actually then find to be true, which is, which happened in this case. I think Anne was describing how her parents had met because they had a mutual connection to a yes. Maharaja, when in fact, actually, you found yes. that wasn't quite right at the beginning. That rosy. Of, right at the beginning of the book, when I started delving into my grandmother Mary's um, early childhood, and she was Anglo-Indian, which, which in the South Asian context essentially means mixed race. So it might be Portuguese and Indian, it might be French Indian. In her case, it was Irish and Indian. And the way they, the way the family told it was that. Uh, you know, that these two people, a young Hindu woman called Mariama and my great grandfather, who was Irish, had sort of met and fallen in love. But there was a 30 year age difference. And I won't give away the story, but actually <laughs> the truth, as I discovered it and, and well, as Anne told it to me, but as I did manage to corroborate in the archives of the British Library, because the records of the British in India oh. are in the Asian and African studies reading room just up the road in the British Library, at least those records that survived. And what my great aunt Anne told me, I was able to corroborate, um, you know, pretty definitively. And it was, uh, you know, it was it was not as smooth a picture as has been as had been put across um, in the family. And and I suspect that I suspect I don't know if my uncle agrees, but I suspect that my grandmother Mary probably knew the truth all along about her parents. But it just wasn't the kind of thing that you would talk about. that you would talk about in those days or, or dwell on. And moving that you. Um... You talk a lot about, we've, you mentioned him already before, but Claude Ockinglek, have I pronounced that right? Yes. Who, as you say, was the second most important man in India yes. ahead of and during partition. And he was also incredibly important to your family. As you yes. say, your uh, grandfather Shahid was yes. his private secretary for the, I think, what, 18 months building up to mm. partition in 1947. 
Can you talk a little bit about why you made the decision to focus so much on him as well? Because he's quite a big character in the book. He is a big character. A Field Marshal Claude Auchinleck, Claude who I think we also have a picture of, um, for anyone who sees this as a portrait um, of him. And this would have been how my grandparents, Shahid and Tyra, would have met and known him in 1946 when they first met in Delhi. I think he's really, you know, my story, the story I've put in the book is is a story of India and Pakistan, but also of Britain. And I think that Auchinleck is really a forgotten British hero. And the reason I put it that way is because I think his, his, uh, the, the kind of atmosphere he engendered, the kind of loyalty he inspired in the armed forces, in these terrible days when law and order was breaking down across many parts of South Asia, not everywhere, but from Calcutta to Bihar to Punjab to around Delhi, there were areas of serious communal violence between Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. And in many of these places, the reason law and order broke down so badly was because the police forces became communal. They were only really interested in protecting their co-religionists. So if you're in Lahore, which is a uh, where the police force might be mainly Muslim, they might only be protecting their co-religious religious in Amritsar. It it would be very different, and then Muslims would be targeted. So, but what what really did happen throughout this period is that the Indian Armed Forces did not do that. They could be relied on where they were available in sufficient numbers, which was not everywhere. They could be relied upon to protect whoever was in need. And I think that was really largely thanks to the leadership of this this extraordinary man who'd had a very hard time during the Second World War. In 1942, had it not been for Auchinleck, Rommel and the Africa Corps and uh, the forces of Nazi Germany might well have swept all the way through North, North Africa and not have been stopped at El Alamein and subsequently then defeated in a battle for which uh, Field Marshal Montgomery claimed all the credit. So Auchinleck was very important in his leadership during the Second World War and then very important in, in preventing the period around independence from being even worse than it was. And he, you know, the sad truth, and I looked at this through the lens of someone who today works a lot on British politics and the exercise of British power. I think when you look at the way British power was exercised in that period, decisions were being taken by a tiny number of people, really only the Viceroy and the Prime Minister Clement Attlee. And people like Auchinleck, who had the responsibility for the armed forces across South Asia, was not being kept in the loop in a way that really, um, you know, didn't serve people well and was really not, you know, not in the interests of the bigger of the bigger picture and of peace and stability. And, and trying to bring British power in South Asia to an end in as responsible a way as possible. I think it's very hard to look at that period and to think that it could not and should not have been handled much better than it was. And I think that reflects on, on Britain at that time. There are moments as well leading up to partition where it looked as though that was advised very strongly against, that it wouldn't work, that it was unworkable. Mm. Right? And you, you must have had moments researching this book where you saw these hinge points, I suppose, where things could have gone so differently and been managed so differently. Yes. Yes, in, in 1946, uh, the, the cabinet sent uh, a mission, a, a, a three-man mission of, of senior political figures to, to figure out how power could be transferred into Indian hands. And this mission concluded that the idea of separating into a, into a predominantly Hindu state and a predominantly Muslim state was just was unworkable. It wouldn't work politically, geographically, communities were too mixed. And little more than a year later, it, it was happening. So I think we have to understand the British context also. It's the period after the Second World War. Labour has been elected uh, clearly with a desire to, you know, well, freedom for India was in the, mm. was in the Labour manifesto of 1945. But also just the, you know, the agenda was domestic, the National mm. Health Service and the foundations of the welfare state. So the, you know, how to discharge responsibilities in colonies like, um, like India and, you know, not long afterwards, the, to end the British mandate in Palestine. These were, these were obviously really important in foreign policy, but in the overall priorities of the government of the time, mm. its focus was, was, on, was on the future here and what the British state should look like. I thought it was, I, I like this quote, you put it right at the front of the book, which was from one of, the, I can't remember whether it was Shahid or Muntaz's memoirs, but I witnessed the dwindling glow of the British Empire 
I saw small men entrusted with great jobs playing with the destiny of millions. Yes, that was I just thought was lovely. Yes, that that was shy. But I think, you know, I think there's no doubt that the person my grandfather is talking about uh, and the person he had in mind when writing that was Lord Mountbatten. Mm. That was he 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 felt that he did not have the diplomatic experience or the knowledge of India to to really deal with the complexities of communities and geography and religion and and the way that the economy is structured and where 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 development has taken place so um you know mountbatten arrived in india in march 1947 and in june the announcement was made that 11 weeks later independence would take place so it was a those were extraordinary months in in terms of the of the timetable and i, I think my my grandfather and really all my grandparents had this immense love admiration and an, and affection for britain and the british and i think that you know the english language was so important to you know they they were almost they were all bilingual or sometimes some of them trilingual and they appreciated and 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 loved everything about um, britain and its emphasis on tradition and heritage and the safeguarding of institutions and i think that feeling they had was really knocked in the summer of 47 because because they just thought but you know surely the british don't do things this way this is this is not as it, as it should be done I'm just going to bring in a question from the audience. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is Patty. I'm an A level student. Um, and the description you've just given of Britain, I think, is one you could possibly use to describe our current situation, <laughs> and you wouldn't realise it as that. Do you think that we can learn, or at least use, perhaps the late 1940s to evaluate the role of Britain in the world today, particularly in the areas you've just described? I think there are certainly. I think there are actually. I would hope that any student of history, whether British, Indian, Pakistani, or from anywhere else in the world, would find something of contemporary relevance from the events in this book. Because I think there are um, there are lots of things that we can think of as lessons now that were realities in my grandparents' life. You know, like for example, the way they thought about. Um, where they would live as minority communities if they would live as minority communities and what that meant and the kinds of safeguards or assurances that would that would allow them to live more easily or or breathe more more easily um that's one then the the role of the military in south asia particularly in pakistan you know my my Grand, my grandparents all lived through the period where martial law first comes in in Pakistan and again the role of the army in Pakistan is you know at the at the forefront of of uh, public life um once again and then i think yes in terms of in terms of britain i mean you know when of course where britain is at a very different moment in time in terms of its uh of its not its reach in the world uh because i think thanks to the english language and history and um and the size of the economy relative to the to the size of the country i think britain does continue to punch above its weight but the particular responsibilities when you've governed colonies for so long and your economy has benefited in so many different ways from that i think um to be mindful of the responsibilities that the way you remove yourself from those colonies essentially the way you cast them off is as important or should be considered as important as the way that you govern and rule them for that period in time as well thank you you <laughs> remember thanks george but um and just following on from that i suppose if we can this idea of um that you have spent a lot of time researching the experience of your family who were displaced by events beyond their control has that shaped how you look at conflicts today and your and your response to how how it should be reported how it should be covered i think it probably of Sudan, i'm thinking of yes, gaza i'm thinking of i think it these. probably has i i do think now when i think about the story of my family i think uh, i'm kind of surprised that there weren't journalists in my family before me because really people's lives were so affected by current affairs and you know like like things the news was not something that you just saw on television or radio or read about it in the papers obviously my grandparents in their young years was not the age of mass media but but it was something that immediately had a knock on effect on your daily life where you live how you live 
and uh, and I think that one of the things I've really learned is that displacement or migration or being a refugee or crossing international borders, there are so many different categories of that. And I'm really conscious of that because in my own family, I've seen many, um, many manifestations of that, or at least several manifestations of that. So I would say that my four grandparents were not refugees. They were not forced out of their homes. They they both, my grandfathers were serving military officers at the time of independence. And both of them had a choice of India or or Pakistan. And, um, and, but other members of my family did leave their homes in India in fear of their lives. They, you know, in, in the case of my grandfather Shahid's mother and and his sisters and his young nieces and nephews, um, they they did see communal violence around them and did start to fear for their lives and did realize that they couldn't rely on the police in their home, then home city of Lucknow, um, in which is now in uh, which is in India today, uh, in the way that they'd hoped to, and that did spark a panic departure from their uh, from their home and. Um, so, so within my own family, I can see that there are many reasons when you know why you move and and how you move. But but in their case as well, I think they kept the keys to their house and thought that they would go back. And I think that is very that is a very familiar refrain from communities elsewhere as well. And it was in that rush departure that you just described that the story of the sari that was then gifted to you comes in, isn't it? Yes. Can you tell yes. us more about that? Right, right at the beginning of the book, I, I, I mention an, an object, and actually there are patterns from that object even in the design of the, of the book cover. When I got married in 2003, there was a, there's a cousin of my mother's who subsequently died, but when, um, when she came to my wedding here in London, she gave me a shawl, and the shawl had a very beautiful embroidered border on it. And she said, this border is all that remains of a sari that was given to my mother, so her mother, on the occasion of my grandparents' wedding in 1940. My grandfather Shahid had several sisters and all of them were given a sari to mark the occasion. And, you know, sari silk, unless it's very well looked after, is going to probably fray over time. But the most, most robust part of any sari is the border. And so the sari had sort of disintegrated over time, but she had removed the border and stitched it onto a shawl and given it to me as a wedding present. But the reason I thought it was so extraordinary is because I knew that they that that cousin was part of this panic departure from Lucknow. And, and I knew that there must have, they, they only took what they could carry in a few suitcases. And therefore, someone had packed this sari for this little girl. My mother's cousin was then a little girl. Her own mother had died. And someone must have thought, this sari belonged to the child's mother. We will take it with us to Pakistan. And I thought, how extraordinary that it survived this journey and a fragment of it is something I have today. So there are so there are still tangible objects in my life that that bear that bear testimony to this extraordinary time. But even though you said your grandparents did have the choice and they made a conscious choice to move to Pakistan, there's an amazing detail there that, about how they nearly they nearly didn't make it. I think Mary Mumtaz had train tickets booked for the 16th yes. of August 1947, the day after partition. And it was only when I think an officer intervened and said, you can't catch a train you have to fly, but they took a plane instead yes. and then later realized what had happened to yes, they, they were, the violence that was consuming the trains at the time. The train that they ways. were booked on and, you know, my uncle would have been a small um, three-year-old at the, um, that, that year, but they, my, you know, Mary and Mumtaz, my grandparents had four children at that point. My father was the eldest, Ijaz, Niaz and Salim was a little baby and they were booked on a train which um, which ended up being one of the notorious ghost trains of that time because these trains were attacked on the way despite having military escorts. Someone would pull the cord, you know, in the middle of a sort of desolate part of the plains of Punjab. And this happened to trains going both ways. So it happened to Muslims, it happened to Hindu and, Hindus and Sikhs as well. And, and, you know, and sometimes everyone on the train would be, um, would be slaughtered. This, and this indeed happened to the train that they were booked on. So they had a narrow escape. And my mother's family too had, mm. um, had, a, had a narrow escape, certainly my grandmother. And this was a story she told me in her lifetime that she, uh, 
she, you know, within the sort of military circle was up in the hill station of Simla because people tried to get away from Delhi in the heat of the summer. And she was up in the hill station in, in Simla and everyone thought that would be perfectly safe. My grandfather Shahid went to Pakistan and said, I'll call for you when things settle down. And things didn't settle down. And it was Orkinlek, the field marshal, who managed to get that you know, to send a platoon of infantry to escort my grandmother Tyra and her three children down with other members of the family. And she did describe to me, she said, as I, as we drove down, the road was lined with, uh, was, was lined with men and the, the looks on their faces terrified me because it looked as if they could rush these vehicles at any moment. So, so they all saw immense danger. And she said, it was only at that moment that I realized what tumult had engulfed the country. I'd been so protected that I didn't realize. And even years later, she would say, I was too immature. She was 27, but she said, I was too immature to realize the gravity of the events around me. And you said, do you think they really, so they kept the keys, I think, to, to their, they thought they would go back. But later you describe how hard it was mm. for your grandparents to return. I think Mary returned to see her parents in India, but that was difficult and that caused problems for Mumtaz's career as well. Yes. There was this, this, this idea that, um, that people with roots in India, actually that should be kept, I suppose, Yes, a bit, it just bit didn't look good because how, relations, how did they between, that? relations between the two countries disintegrated, you know, straight away. And then towards the autumn of 1947, there was the Kashmir crisis, which still remains a, a, a running sore. And, and so, for both my grandfathers who were serving officers, my grandfather Montaz was a doctor, but serving um, in um, first in the in the in the air force and then later in the army medical corps, uh, and then my grandfather Shahid was also a, a serving army officer. It just didn't look good to have wives who were travelling to India to see fam. It sort of brought your loyalty into question, and logistically, it wasn't easy either. Distances were great. You know, not, neither of these families had much money to travel, like, thousands of miles in the case of my grandmother Mary. She did it very few times. I think she probably only did it from 1947 to the end of her life. I think she probably did it three, maybe maybe four times. Mm. So it, it was an incredible, and, and my grandfather Shahid, whose home city of Lucknow, he only visited it once more in his life. So between 1947 and 1993. And that was only because quite a long time after he retired from the army, even then it wasn't so easy to get a visa. And finally, he became friendly with an Indian high commissioner in Islamabad who said, I can get you a visa um, if you, um, because he had said, I just want to go and pray at my father's grave again before I die, because his father had died in like now before independence. So there was, they had this immense break in their lives with, from all the places that they had grown up in, not just the people who were part of their childhood, but the places um, that they went back to. My grandmother Thyra was the only one who, because her parents were left behind, she, to, to my grandfather Shahid's credit, he, you know, he, he said, I won't stand in your way. And she kept going back every year, but it became harder and harder and harder. And actually, after a while, she didn't, she no longer touched base with her old um, Indian friends anymore. She would just go straight from Pakistan, straight to her parents' home and not drop in on any of her friends because she realized it was awkward for them to have a friend visiting from, from Pakistan. It didn't look good for them either. So this was the state of relations, which, you know, now we're getting to the point where these events are fading out of living memory. And and then there's, you know, you're, just, you're left with... with citizens of neighboring countries who have very little contact with each other. And, you know, that to me is another ongoing sadness of all of this. And you just think how different it could have been. If how different it could have been. But, but there, I think it could only have been different, I think, had, had Britain played a different role and a more engaged role and, um, and you know, and, and kept a different hold on things un until there was a sort of settled form of government and a settled situation with law and order. How has writing this book shaped your sense of your own identity, I suppose? You, you've, we've only met about an hour ago, but just to sort of delve into this, the, you, you write that when you were at boarding school, for example, you didn't feel you had the, the deep roots that some of your contemporaries did with similar families yes. who had generations going back in sort of the same areas. Has writing this and researching this um, shaped your sense of, of who you are and where you've come from? I think it has definitely made me more 
grounded in that I really was able to put all the pieces of history, not just my family story, but but this period in history has shaped the lives of so many of us who live in Britain today because one lot of migration then was often followed by subsequent waves of migration in the 1950s or the 1960s, whether it's from Pakistani Kashmir, where many British Pakistanis come from, or from the Punjab, and both sides, the Indian and Pakistani part of Punjab. So, so this history has definitely affected many people like me in this country. And yet, because it's so complex, I feel with all my years in journalism and being interested in this period, I never could, I, 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 st- I just didn't feel I had the full picture of the jigsaw and what happened when and, and what led to what. And now I feel I finally got my head around all the history as well as my personal story. So I think it has, I think it has grounded me. I think it has given me a certain security and that I really know now where I came from. I really know how, the, you know, the influences on my grandparents and my parents. And that is absolutely linked to who I am today. I'm going to bring in some, sorry, there, there are lights shining in my face. So please do like wave at me if you want to get involved, because I'm not seeing everyone putting their hand up. <laughs> no, you should just be able to speak into Could you just uh, say your name first? I'm Susie Ann Curling. And um, there are several points at which me shouting your book has parallels for me. Um, I have read it completely and I'm on my second reading because I am writing a family history (laughs) because Charles James Napier married one of my ancestors. Um, So I'm in sin with Charles James Mm. Napier at the moment. Um, But what I wanted to know was whether, because I'm Irish, my passport says I'm Irish, my mother's maiden name was Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think um, we're related? Well, we could be a gene or two. <laughs> but um, I wondered, have you ever thought what it would have been like if the British had never gone to India? Never gone to India. Yes. I mean, that is... Oh, or, or perhaps I think they would always have gone to India, but if they'd gone to India as traders and remained there as traders and not not try to uh, acquire, conquer, seize territory that, that in different ways. That has bothered me about Ireland since I was a child. You know, what would Ireland have been like if the English had never gone there? Mm. If they'd been allowed time to develop in their own way, that how, how different would their culture be? I think the really important thing to remember about, about India before the British um, and India through the first sort of, you know, um, Europeans first arrived at what, the beginning of the 16th century. Mm-hmm. And, and then by 1757 is really the period where British power is really, is really entrenched and continues to be so. And then actually the ne- even the next hundred years, more territory is annexed in, in different, in, in, well, just annexed really by that stage. That's the major form of, of, um, of acquisition. I think it's really important to remember just what a complex and what a sophisticated society India was before Europeans came. The dominant power was was the Mughal Empire, but um, in a a form of government that the British also emulated in many ways, you know, you, you... you were sensible to make alliances and not try to conquer territory everywhere. There were there were sort of smarter ways to to maintain a presence, and often that was you know alliances and treaties. And so so really, you're talking about a, a patchwork of different rulers of different kinds, and 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 those dynasties rise and fall. So there was no one monolith that that the British replaced, and the Mughal Empire was already was already in decline, but. Um, you know, you can certainly see economically that India was a world leader in textiles. That whole model of um, fabric and cloth and its role in the Indian economy completely changed through through colonial times because rather than take the um, take the the finished fabrics to Europe, which was what which was what the East, East India Company was doing at the beginning, industrialization meant you would take the raw materials and then you would produce those fabrics in mills in Britain and then you would try and export export those products back to India. So that whole, you know, the economics of the time is absolutely wrapped up with the politics, how you, um, how, what colonialism and colonial rule does to economies and products and trade and 
Uh, and of course, then India lost out completely as industrialization took place in, in Europe and, and India became a place largely of the export of raw materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Have you just given you a taste for writing more history books? It sounds as though oh, you've got more. A lot of people have already asked me whether I'm writing, and I, I feel like I just want to enjoy the fruits of this particular labour of love being finished. And I, in some ways, I haven't really been able to enjoy the experience of it being out in the world because the election was called <laughs> like days before the book was published. So on the, the actual night of publication, I was preparing for the seven-way leaders debate. So I thought these two big things are happening at exactly the same time, and I don't really, I haven't really had a chance to enjoy having the book out um, in the world. But what will I do next? I, I do think that there were, there were aspects of the history that I only touched on briefly that I definitely think could, could be books in, in and of themselves. I don't know, and have been books elsewhere, but maybe there's a new take on them. The Indian National Army and the, the Indians who did join the Japanese in the Second World War in Burma and Malaya... Um, I think that's really interesting. And the way that those people were viewed in Pakistan was quite different to the way they were viewed in, in India after independence. So that's one that's one story. But yeah, there, there are many things that I touched on I couldn't dig into. But well, there's a line that says think. Shahid set up the intelligence services in Pakistan. And that's just a line there. But that struck yeah. me as something that could... Could be expanded. Yes, in and although itself. you know that was that was literally a job that he did straight after independence. You can imagine straight after independence, a, a new army needs to set itself up, uh, you know, across many different areas. And and the Pakistan army had a particularly hard time immediately after independence because lots of assets that should have come to it were not sent over from um, from uh, from independent India. And um, yes, he did set up what became um, Inter-Services Intelligence, which is an agency of the Pakistan Army that still exists today. But he said to my, my grandmother, uh, this was a job that I did for a year and I wanted to go back to a command. And he did then return to a command and left that behind because he said working in he said I didn't like working in intelligence it makes you suspicious of everyone <laughs> so he was conscious that that was not an area of of the military that he wanted to stay in and so. what about your grandparents life in pakistan in the decades after because you talk about immediately after sort of it within a year jinnah had died and yes. that kind of major leadership figure was no longer there and again that kind of sense of lost opportunity there and how yeah. different things this could was, have been. This was an absolute tragedy for Pakistan to lose your founding father a little over a year after independence. Uh, India had Nehru, its first prime minister, until 1964. He died in office and Pakistan only had um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah until September 1948. And I think that that was, and then the period that followed the first prime minister of independent Pakistan was assassinated. And then in the 1950s, uh, martial law was declared. Um, so, you know, I think that all four of my grandparents lived with, um, lived with a lot of sadness about, um, a, you know, they, 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 they both write, both Shahid and Mumtaz write about the incredible sort of they arrived in Pakistan and they could see that the country hardly had anything, but everyone was filled with this sort of spirit of, you know, we need to build this country, we need to do our best. And and then they live with a lot of sadness. And um, and my grandmother, Tyra, in these tapes I found, uh, in these audio tapes I found, is really, which she's recording in the 80s and 90s. And, and she says firmly, you know, they were really not political, not apolitical. They were engaged in politics, but they were not political people, my family. But by this stage of her life, she, you know, she says we should have started to protest. She said, she said, my generation can take the blame. We should have started to protest. So I think, I think she felt that rather than try and paper, paper over the cracks and hope for the best, I think she felt later in her life that perhaps she should have been out on the streets in a way that I can't imagine her being, but that was the conclusion that she that she came to. What was it like hearing her voice again on the tapes? Because you found them yes. after she had died, yes. is that right? It was my mother who said, I think I've got some tapes somewhere. And and she found them and it just said on the on the old cassette tape, it just said, Amma talking, Amma being mother. And and I looked at them and I said, Have you got a tape recorder? And she said, No. Do you? And I said, no. And I said, we better buy one. I thought, God, I hope they still sell them, cassette players. I wasn't even sure, you know, but thankfully they do still sell them. And 
And it was an extraordinary feeling to put this, to put the cassette in and press play and to hear my grandmother's voice again and talking about exactly the kind of thing that I would have liked to be able to ask her. So there were, some of it was, were, were things she told me before and she repeated but added more detail and 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 some you know some was completely new so I was really lucky I worried I didn't have enough material but actually in the end I think I did have enough material even on the women uh, and they're the two women yes, who were on the front cover interesting cho- uh, obviously you had the memoirs from your grandfather <laughs> yes. because the grandmothers you chose to put on the front yes um but yeah but but actually I'm glad it was the story of all four of them but yeah. but so because I still think that what my two grandfathers gave me and actually my grandfather Mumtaz what I'm really grateful to him for is that he painted a whole picture of the social fabric that of of the country and particularly he grew up in a very conservative home in Multan in the south of Punjab but he was able he had such an eye for detail he was able to describe the the household where people lived so close to each other you know if someone was dying they'd be in the next room and you would be sitting at their bedside if someone was giving birth you would hear uh you would hear the woman in labor and then he would also he was also able to describe to me the social um conditions of the time and how his mother and his sister were in parda and exactly what that meant what they wore um how they generally only went out of the house in the evening and 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 even he described how his mother when she traveled outside multan she had a chance to once they got a certain way out of the city she had a chance to take off her her burqa and the the sort of relish with which she took it off and flung it to flung it to one side and her husband would not be completely happy about this but had to go along with it and i thought these are incredible details which tell me how people lived and and which i would never have known i would just thought okay my great grandmother lived in parda but what that actually meant yeah i wouldn't have known had he not described it in that way we've got a question over there from my colleague phoebe hi yeah my name's phoebe i'm a reporter here um i'm just struck and it's quite a practical question is by you know physical like the audio recordings something saved on a computer hard drive um physical published copies and something that i worry about reporting at the moment is that things feel very although there's a lot of information out there i do have this fear that things can be taken off of a social media yes. website things can disappear quite easily and it feels like everything's being recorded but actually you know in 20 30 50 years will those things be accurately um accountable things yes. like like you said you don't have a tape recorder anymore but you can go buy one mm. and uh, you know i think it's just especially things like recent tech outages have just shown how fragile those systems yeah. can be so i'm curious how when you look at stories being reported at the moment for example mm. sudan gaza these events is how much do you worry that you know in 50 years will we have these kind of accurate records i'd like in 50 years for someone to write yeah. you know, my family's history and what's happened to the, to that yeah. and is it just, if that's something that has crossed your mind yes and actually at the same time. totally and Chloe, it really worries me it's like what what are we leaving behind we just don't document things in the same way you know i found some extraordinary letters which i touched on in the book a bit but you know the letters of farewell mm-hmm. people wrote to you you're going on this long journey you know this is my letter of farewell i mean we just like you know they barely say goodbye in a text it's like <laughs> because you can keep in touch all the time you don't yeah. you don't need to do that so you don't document your feelings in the same way i mean basically basically there's you know instagram or you know but like this is basically our form of diary writing unless you and i and and i do feel there's going to be an immense amount that that we lose of really thinking about our feelings and how we express ourselves to um to to other people um so but but even what what i would say to anyone who's you know parents or grandparents are still with you things like photograph albums get them to annotate exactly who all these people are because i was really lucky that My grandfather Shahid in particular was a great hoarder. He kept everything, right? I've got in the book is the letter and he must have asked for this back from Orkinlek his boss, but there is the letter that he wrote to Orkinlek saying, "Please can you get my wife and children down from Simla because they're not safe." Right? He kept that. But and in all of his photograph albums he said left to right so and so so and so so and so. Because otherwise, I mean, I know people who've cleared out their parents' belongings and they've got photograph albums and they recognize their parents, they can't recognize anyone else in these in these pictures. And you know, these are all our histories and I uh, so yeah, we don't document, but whatever we still have, we should at least try and annotate properly the um you know the the things that that we do still have in our possession but yeah the kind of the love letters the farewell letters 
I've got the letters, you know, asking permission to my my grandfather and his soon to be father in law negotiating on the date of of the wedding. He wants to get married really soon because he's being sent to the front. His soon to be father in law is horrified that basically he's trying to marry his daughter before he goes off to the, to a front line in the Second World War. So these are you know these are exchanges that that are are so revealing and. Uh, and we just we we just don't communicate in that way anymore, and I think it is a loss. Now that this chapter has closed, or at least you're going to enjoy it for the next few months, at least because you were not able to do so when it first came out. Have you started thinking about what the next step might be for you, the next sort of chapter? Oh, I think when you get sorry, I think my husband, my husband, and yes, he's over here. I think he might be absolutely horrified if I say I'm going to write another book. Um, so I'm not sure I'm allowed to um, to talk about to talk about another another book because it does take a huge amount of time out of your out of your personal life and your life with your family. But um, I do feel, in a way, I think what this has done is it's given me confidence beyond journalism. I felt like. I've honed my skills in journalism, and like a journalist is who I am, and a broadcaster is who I am. And I think this, you know, when you write something at this kind of length, and when you have to apply your research skills and your interviewing skills, because I had to interview members of my family, and that was a weird <laughs> experience, right? I have to, because often I was asking them quite intimate things. I was asking them, so how, why do you think that person got married to? that person and what happened and and then and then I'd have to reassure them that I wasn't trying to write some kind of you know a racy memoir about people's divorces or you know I but I just needed to understand Was there a suspicion that you might well I think I think I, I did get some odd looks and people were like and then they thought gosh is she going to do some kind of you know spill the beans and air all the family's dirty laundry and I I was I was interested in in the bigger picture but I needed to understand the smaller picture kind of really like who was if they weren't still married, then they were in different places. And that was the kind of thing I needed to know. So I think there was a bit of, there probably was a bit of wariness from some members of my family, but they also placed their their trust in me and their faith in me. But And I did therefore learn a different set of interviewing skills. So I think I, I think therefore I do have the confidence that I can tackle really big subjects at length because this is a huge and very contentious piece of history. And I like to think that I have tackled it in a way that's accessible. You know, the things that really mean a lot, uh, mean the most to me probably is when people say, you know, I, I thought that this that this book would be too hard, but I found it easy to get into. And that means a lot to me because I really do feel that history can be told through individual lives and, and, through, and through individual families. And that's what I've tried to do. But at times it was really taxing and quite scary because you know, I am trying to think. My my grandparents came at this largely from one direction, from the point of view of, of mostly a Pakistani Muslim family, although one of my grandparents was a devout Catholic. But I needed to be fair to all communities and to think about what other communities would have experienced. And ultimately, I found that usually it was a mirror image. You know, what they went through, others were going through mm. as well. So I've tried to bring those threads together, if you like. But it, it was scary at times. You tempted to launch your own podcast next, or is that does uh, that line of well, work not appeal? I mean, I have, I have. Well, I've certainly got the audio relating to this, so I have got some um, audio available that has not yet been used. It doesn't even um, have to no be. No one at the BBC has asked me to to use uh, to use this audio as yet. But yeah, maybe maybe other things. I think I'm really interested in in sort of also survivors from that generation who are still there. I mean, obviously I talked to my 100 year old great aunt, but I, so I still think that the story of everywhere in the world, the story of people who were born in the early part of the 20th century, that was an, ex I mean, I don't know what this century has in store for us yet, right? But the 20th century, the shift from empire to nation state, this was happening everywhere at tremendous cost to people's lives. And I'm kind of interested in that generation pretty much anywhere in the world. So yeah, maybe. Yes, please. Can we get a microphone to the middle of the room, please? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Zeba Hussain. Um, so, same, same surname. Um, Are we related? I'm, I mean, I'm just I'm wondering, like, how many yours, potential yours, relatives? Yours is the first surname I've seen that has, like, one S. So, it was, like, really surprising. Well, that was my grandfather's choice of how to spell it that way, because obviously it's, like, however you choose to spell, to spell a, an Arabic or Urdu word. 
Um, funnily enough, my parents um, are also from Lucknow. Mm. Um, so I'm just intrigued to understand sort of whether you've looked beyond Lucknow and your grandfather's heritage, um, like Shahid Mumtaz, and where they came from before Lucknow, especially because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just really interested in my own family. So yeah. It'd be interesting to hear another, I guess, Lucknowese, um, like, Yes. Origins. Well, I have I have yet to go to Lucknow myself and I would really I would really love to. Actually, my four grandparents because they came from four different parts of um of the Indian subcontinent. So, one child was from Lucknow. Um he married Tyra who's from Aligarh near Delhi, uh, which is still the site of uh, the Muslim University of Aligarh which developed uh, again in particularly developed in the beginning in the early part of the 20th century and that was why her family moved there um, then my grandfather Mumtaz from Multan in the south of Punjab and then my grandmother Mary from um, the area around Vizekha Putnam in what is now Andhra Pradesh in India so I do know a bit about their um, there are all four of their origins and and with Shahid I've I know a fair amount because he had a family tree that went back to the Prophet Muhammad, which I think is pretty credible. I mean, I can't be sure of every single person on it, but it certainly does. You know, when I open it out across all of the generations, you can. And I recently went to Uzbekistan and and did trace um, one of his ancestors in about the 13th century and wrote about that for the Guardian. So I have done I have done a bit of digging further back into his own into his own story. So. You know, again, South Asia is so wonderfully complex ethnically that way. His ancestors would have come um, after Babur, who founded the Mughal Empire, and he came down from Central Asia into India, uh, first Afghanistan and then into India. And, you know, so, yeah, that, that's, that's a big mass, big migration. But before that, his ancestors would have been from Arabia. So there are so many migrations in the, in the story of the family. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone else at the back there? Or... Was there another hand up that I've missed? No? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes, this is going to be the... This is my uncle. <laughs> Hang on, we're just... Sorry, there's just a mic coming your way. Thank you. Um, you said that you um, uh, thought about this book, starting this book, and it, over two years, you thought about it, mm. but there must have been some event or somebody who might have suggested it. What triggered the idea to write this and about our families? Well, um, you're right. There was a particular point, which is that um, essentially my, my, my publisher and my uh, agent, who's, a, who's an old school friend of mine, so she's been part of my life for a long time. F for the longest time, I knew that they were both very keen that I write something personal. And I just didn't know what that personal thing was. I don't feel like, I mean, I know some people write sort of, you know, autobiographies. I mean, the celebs write autobiographies, right? And in like, even in their 20s. But I don't feel like I've got to the point where I, I, I'm ready to sort of look back on my life or to look at my <laughs> professional life or my, you know, so I was like, what is, you know, what might I write that's personal? And I just didn't really feel there was enough there. And then I happened to, I was sort of playing around with a, with a few ideas. And actually, one thing I had written about in the briefest, I think it was just a, it was, it was literally a few lines, but, um, but I'd written about when I went to Jerusalem with, um, with your father, with my grandfather Mumtaz in 2003. And he had said to me, I would really, really like to, um, to see Al-Aqsa, the mosque in Jerusalem, and to pray there before I die. And, and, and I said, why don't we try and do this trip? And we did this trip together. It was incredibly um, resonant and emotional for us both. We just went for a few days and it was a very difficult time um, to make that that journey in 2003 it was a, it was a um, it was a difficult time in the in the conflict and she looked at this and she said i'm just really interested in your relationship with your grandfather and can you think about writing something so it was it was really my publisher louise who picked up on this idea of my relationship with my grandparents and and that made me think more about it and i think that's what led me to the idea of of tyra and mary and charting their lives but in the end i did end up with with all four of the grandparents so that so when 
I felt like, yes, this is personal. I, this is a very personal book to me. I think if you read this, you can see exactly how I've been brought up. You can see um, the places that are part of my upbringing, the language that's part of my upbringing. There's quite a lot of Urdu within it. And so it is a deeply personal book. And at times it felt quite exposing. But because it's also about history, I, I felt comfortable with the subject matter. And I think somewhere I'm just not that comfortable with, with books that are all going to be about me. I think I just, I just resist. I still feel like I'm a broadcaster. I'm in public life, but I really don't like the cult of personality that's in so much broadcasting and journalism. So I still needed the vehicle that was, that allowed me to be personal, but tell something that I thought was worth telling in a bigger way and to which I had a slight distance, if that makes sense. So it's kind of both far away from me in terms of the history, but also personal. But yes, you're right. There was a, there was a particular trigger. Yeah, I think we are almost out of time, but yes, please. One more. It's kind of on the same thing, but I mean, I guess you've sort of mentioned it before, but I guess the day job, how did those skills help or were there other skills that you had to develop to sort of write this and then also What's your experience of being not the questioner, but the answer in this case? It's much harder doing the answering <laughs> than it is asking the questions. But I'm, and it's, so the skills, in, in a way, I think that the, my day job was, was a barrier in some ways in that, you know, being part of the BBC and being so embedded in impartiality being part of your life, it, it can be a barrier to digging into something like this because, uh, because you are going to approach it from a direction because it's your personal story. So somehow you have to navigate um, that personal direction with the fairness and the, um, and the, the outlook that's part of your professional life. And that I think is also very natural to me and part of me personally as well. So I think I had to kind of overcome that barrier. But then also, yeah, the, the, the interviewing and the research skills and God, I wish I'd had a producer for this book. It would have been a much easier. I appreciate producers more than ever before when you realize you're on your own, essentially, in doing a book like this. I, um, I, yeah, I really missed, uh, I, I, because I'm so used to working part of it as part of a team. A book is a very, very solitary exercise. And so in that, in that way, I wasn't equipped for that at all because I'm, I'm not, you know, if you're a columnist, you're used to your solo enterprise, but I'm very much a, a team player. So I had to go out on a limb on this and I didn't actually, I didn't tell people really. I mean, apart from my husband and 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 my close family. I mean, obviously he lived with the book, and he he was slightly horrified every time. Um, Makes didn't you sort of say like, what is going on here? Because he thought I was just writing about my family, and then this pile of like World War II memoirs and East India Company memoirs, and you know all these other kind of tomes start filling up my desk. And he's like, what is going on here? But so, yeah, it was, it was a very daunting project, but I do have a feeling of tremendous achievement having completed it because I feel if nothing else, I've got it all straight in my head <laughs> and my children's heritage is there for them to, for them to know. And I think and hope that for you, Zeba, and to many other people who are connected to this and to people who are just interested in this, in this period of time, I hope it has, you know, something to reveal and something that is has largely sort of faded from our memories and I think deserves to be better known. Agreed. Well, Michelle, thank you very much. Yes. I think we will leave it there. Now, you have been awake for a very long time today <laughs> because I heard you on the radio this morning, but if you can, I think you can stay for a little bit to do some book signing. So please, everybody, buy a copy, grab a drink, line up, and I think <laughs> there'll be about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes maybe, where you can answer a couple of questions. Thank you. And, and, and thanks to all the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.